so many questions since Thursday's mass shooting at FedEx. A lot of talk about Indiana's red flag law and how does it really work? What does it mean? It does allow police or courts to seize guns from people who may commit a violent act. It became law in 2005 after the death of IPD officer Jake Laird. He was killed by a man whose weapons had been returned to him even though he had mental health issues. The law meant to prevent people from buying or possessing firearms if they're found to be Im imminent risk to themselves or others. There's a lot more to it though and joining me live from downtown is attorney Ralph Staples to explain more about how this law works or really how it was intended to work and in some cases how it does work. Ralph, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, you have some good insight here, and when you hear people talking about this, I'm sure you say, "Okay, wait. There's it's a lot. There's a lot more going on here. Where do you start with trying to explain it?" Well, you have to make sure people understand that the law requires a hearing to be held in order for all the moving parts to you know kick in. A judge has to find that a person is either dangerous, presents an imminent risk or a probable risk or has a mental illness that is demonstrated through you know evidence presented to the court at that point you know, if that finding is made by the court then that person's name is put into a database or the databases that licensed firearms dealers would know not to sell this person a weapon because there was no hearing in this case and there was no finding you know, this person's name was not placed in those databases and he could go out and legally purchase a new weapon. We heard the prosecutor, um, you know, here talking a little bit more about that specifically in this case in particular. And I know that for a lot of people, you know, they have rights. People have rights, as they should have rights. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, as we dig into this a little bit deeper, you know, people want solutions, and and they want if if you know, Brandon Hole had these mental conditions, and if there was more to be done, there are people that want to be able to save and help people. Do you have an opinion on wh where, where we could do better? Well, and that's the thing. You have a clash of interests. The police and the prosecutors have the interest of public safety. The individual, the person, has his or her constitutional rights to privacy and the right to possess a firearm. And so often these things clash. And, you know, we're taught in law school that yeah. bad facts make bad law. And the facts here were bad. Uh, the, the voluntary surrender of a weapon seemed to solve the problem, I think, as law enforcement saw it. Now, did someone ask the question, well, what if this guy mm -hmm. goes out and tries to buy another? Well, it seems like that question didn't get asked. Yeah. And then that's when you get into court and that's when the rights you know, start to come into play. Can I be shown or will it be shown that I am a danger to myself or other people? Am I an, Im an imminent risk? Am I a probable risk or do I have a mental illness and I'm not taking my medication? So again, you know, you, you, as a country, we're designed to protect the rights of the individual but also you know, to protect the rights of everyone else. And this clash makes it very difficult to come up with a solution that, you know, the, the word fairness, yeah. you know, fundamental fairness comes, comes into play, but it just makes it difficult. And no legislation, you know, rammed through in the General Assembly is going to solve that problem quickly. Ralph Staples, thank you so much for your time, attorney here in Indianapolis. We appreciate your, appreciate your insight. We hope you have a great day.